Well, uh, it's interesting when people speak of areas of evolution for which we have no explanations. All the fundamental concepts of the evolutionary process are understood, at least at some fundamental uh, set, uh, say fundamental level. Um, now, are there gaps? Not gaps in the sense that people think. People now speak of gaps, for example, in the in 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 the record. You know, we don't have fossils from before the Cambrian explosion. But so what? We, the record is complete. It's not complete by means of fossils. You see, in Darwin's time, the only way to reconstruct evolutionary history was by studying fossils, by comparative anatomy, comparative embryology, biogeography. That was 150 years ago. Science has advanced tremendously. We can now reconstruct evolutionary history with much more powerful methods, the methods of molecular biology, by looking at DNA, by looking at proteins. And with those methods, we have reconstructed the record completely. We can go back to the uh, organism or group of organisms that are called LUCA, L-U-C-A, L-U-C-A, for the last universal common ancestor. We can find the common ancestors of all animals, common ancestors of all plants, of all fungi, of all bacteria. We can f find the we can reconstruct the history of the common ancestors of plants and animals and fungi and bacteria going back to the very beginning. We don't know all the details because who wants to know all the details? I mean, you you are studying the 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 Rocky Mountains. You don't want to have necessarily a map where every tree, every tree and every rock is there. Now you want to know the detail of a particular area within the rock and mountains, you can go there and study it in as much detail as you want and find every little rock, every little leaf, every little tree, every little plant there. It's the same with evolution. We can, go, go, we can now look at any area of evolutionary history and we can understand it with as much detail as we wish. The methods of molecular biology are so powerful, are so quantitative and also are so redundant that we can study anything that we want with as much detail as we want. Now, there is another way in which the people who propose, propo propound intelligent design speak of as, at, uh, at about, um, you know, gaps in the record that how did the eye come about? Well, we understand now that at the genetic level quite well, we actually understand that at almost every other level, they make the unwarranted and erroneous assumption that if something is complex and every part depends in every other part, that the, it could not have come about by evolution. It's like a watch. It does not help to have a, you know, one little piece or the other piece or the other piece. You have to have them all or you don't have a watch. But that's not so with organisms. See, so we have in mollusks today, these are snails and clams and that sort of squids. Uh, we have an example examples of eyes which go from the simplest to the most complex. And I'm going to speak about eyes because the eye is one example they use unless you have everything, unless you have the cornea and the lens and the retina and the uh, and the and the uh, um, optical nerve having one part of this alone doesn't help. Well in mollusks, in some mollusks called limpets, they have something that you can call eyes. They are just a few pigmented cells linked to single neurons, nerve cells, which carry the information to the primitive brain of these creatures. Just a few pigmented cells. Then we have mollusks which have uh, more pigmented cells and some of them forming a kind of cup which allows to detect the direction of the light. Then they have w we have what are called pinhole eyes, which are this gap still a little more extreme and with more sensitive, uh, sensitive to light cells and more nerve cells. And then you ha we have animals, uh, still speaking about mollusks, which they have just a simple refractive lens as well as the 
sensitive light sensitive cells which eventually in advanced organisms gave rise to the give rise to the retina then you go all the way to octopus and squids which have an eye very much like ours it has cornea it has a lens it has a retina it has muscles to move it, it has a, a an optic nerve curiously enough the eye of the squid is m better than ours in that we have a substantial imperfection that they don't have. For historical reasons, this for the hi evolutionary history of how the human eye came about, the n neurons that re register the signals in the retina are inside the eye. So for those signals to go to the brain, the, they get these nerve cells get collected in the, in the optic nerve. The optic nerve has to cross the retina. So we have a blind spot. Now, squids and octopuses have the nerve cells connected to what is the retina from the outside. So they collect into the nerves, into the optic nerve. They send the signal to the brain without having a, a blind spot. Well, the general point I am making is that there are complex uh, organs and, and and functions that we may not know in detail, but any time that we investigate any one of those, we discover the details. And it's again, I'm going to put it bluntly, blasphemous to try to think of a God who is there waiting for something from time to time to come and intervene, and I'm going to make an eye. Well, primitive organisms don't have eyes, so God waited a few thousand million years to two and a half, three thousand million years in order to have organisms with eyes, then later on did this and that. This is what the theologians in the old times called the God of the gaps heresy. There's a th trying to justify God as in order to account for things that we don't know. You know, fill in the gaps. For since that we don't know and that are knowledgeable by, by scientific research, we have science. We should do scientific research. We should not be putting this uh, God as a, an engineer that is trying to fix little things from time to time. I mean, what vision of God is that? Moreover, there is another problem, and it is that the implication of intelligent design is that we have, that God is a very, very bad engineer. Think of the example that I was telling you a moment ago of the human eye. I mean, an engineer who had designed an eye with the optic nerve having to cross the retina will be fired. You better do it the octopus way. Um, an engineer that would have designed the human jaw would be fired. Our jaw is not big enough for all our teeth. So they have, we have to pull the, the, the wisdom teeth and very often have to straighten the others, and the orthodontists make a very good living straightening the teeth because do we have too many teeth or too large for our jaw? Engineers who have designed a jaw that does not big for the teeth would be fired. God making this trivial, obvious mistake and errors of design, well, maybe their God does those things, certainly not mine. I don't want to have to worship a God that it is uh, um, not smart enough to do as well as a human engineer. 